Hello, everyone. It's Sandy Rosenthal with Beat the Big Guys, and I'm so excited about the guest that I have with me today. His name is Ed Bodka. Hello, Ed. Hey, Sandy. It's so nice to see you. Ever since uh, I started even thinking about hosting my own podcast, I've always, always known that you would be my guest on the show because of the amazing work that you've done uh, over the past decade and the, and the amazing success that you've had. So let me tell my listeners a little bit about Ed. Obviously, I, I already know a lot, but I'm gonna share that with you now. Uh, Mr. Bodker was environmental program manager for the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development for 27 years. He was wetlands research associate at LSU for four years. So he is unofficially, I mean, he is officially a bona fide expert that we have with us today. Uh, and there's one other thing that I really want to share with everyone. Uh, I found out that Mr. Bodko at one time was a, cha a chaplain uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And I really wasn't surprised to hear about that. That explains a lot to me about uh, why Mr. Bodko is just so persistent and he didn't give up and he wanted to make sure that he did the right thing and he did. And you're gonna hear a lot more about that in the next few minutes. So let me bring you up to snuff. Uh, Mr. Bodko led a, a decade long battle to expose the danger to human being that's caused by something called wetlands assimilation. You're gonna hear all about that in a few minutes. This process was supposed to build new healthy wetlands and it was ballyhooed when it was introduced and it was seen as the great panacea, a win-win for all, said to all those uh, companies who were gonna make a lot of money uh, doing that wetland dissemination, uh, doing that wetlands assimilation. Uh, this is the same industry that would make money on the equipment and the operations of doing this process. But it turns out it was too good to be true. And Ed Bodker became the face of the opposition to this dangerous and powerful industry. So I've just given our lis listeners a little taste of what wetland assimilation is. Can you explain that to the folks um, just a little so that we understand what was going on with that? Okay, Sandy. Uh, <clears throat> the term wetland assimilation comes from uh, the process of discharging partially treated uh, sewage into natural wetlands so that the wetlands will incorporate the effluent and the constituents in the effluent. And the hope for this concept was that it would fertilize vegetation and make it grow faster and therefore uh, accrete or accumulate more um, soil for, uh, to combat erosion and um, inundation. Uh, the problem, however, is that uh, there's liabilities associated with too much fertilization. And it's a lot of it gets uncontrolled once it enters the natural environment, it can't be controlled. And so you lose control over it. And both the environment and potential health risk increase their liabilities as uh, that control is lost in the Thanks. natural environment. Thank you for explaining that. And so now we understand it was, it, when it was first introduced, it was supposed to be wonderful. It was going to save our wetlands. And everyone was so excited. The Lake Pontchartrain Basin Foundation endorsed it and gave their full uh, wholehearted support for it. But unfortunately, as maybe we should have known, some things are just too good to be true. Uh, it, it wasn't uh, what it was cracked up to be. Uh, um, Mr. Bodko, is it all right if I call you Ed? Yes, Ed, Okay, please. so Ed, uh, you asked to meet with me uh, five, six years ago, um, maybe a little more, and, uh, and you, you, we had a little meeting, we had coffee, and, and you said to me that, you know, I really thought that all I had to do was just bring this information to the Department of Environmental Quality in Louisiana and it would be done. And they would see the light and they, and they would you know, stop this, this dangerous process. And then it turned out that didn't even get you to first base. And that was what, what we were talking about. And I, I was a little confused. I said, Ed, would you explain to me 
you know, what's the danger? What's the great harm that's going to be done? And and do it in one sentence. And I and I remember you you because you know you wanted to tell me everything. I said no, Ed. I need it in one sentence. And finally, he says he says because it's turning the wetlands into one giant toxic petri dish. And I said that's it. I said that's what you've got to start saying to people. I said you, you need to explain to people in just a few sentences, one preferably, you know, what's the harm, what's the danger, and that I tell you what, that scared the pants off of me. And I vowed from that moment forward that I would do everything in my power to assist you with uh, your work and making this process, uh, putting it, shining a light on it, making sure that people found out about it because very powerful people didn't like what you were saying. Isn't that right, Ed? Well, that is pretty much it. Uh, people did not like to be to have criticism of a project that they were touting as something that was uh, helpful to the environment, and uh, both the uh, both uh, DEQ and the consultants who were promoting this uh, resisted any criticism that uh, the public had for it. And so, uh, yes, that's fairly well uh, accurate. Um, <laughs> Feel free to correct me if I've, I've well, understated or overstated. I mean, this is well, oh. it's easy to overstate in both directions. Win-win is a grossly over, uh, grossly overstated, positive, and uh, it's been called all kinds of other names by locals that could be considered overstated in the negative, but. There's a great deal of unknown that lies in between, and some of that unknown uh, holds potential for liabilities that have not been considered in, in detailed uh, depth. And I so, recall that, because um, I attended one of these, uh, a meeting uh, dis discussing this process, and I recall that um, one of the um, opponents of it who had joined you said not only was this process, which we call wetlands assimilation, not only was it not building more wetlands, it was destroying wetlands. I mean, it was doing the opposite of what it was designed to do. Maybe not everywhere, but certainly in some places. Do I have that right? Uh, yes, in some places it has uh, reduced uh, the wetlands over a period of time, and those, and it's a dynamic process. Some one year it might be open water, the next year it might be floating vegetation, but originally it was rooted vegetation. So you're moving, even if it has floating vegetation, it's less uh, desirable than the original state before the discharge occurred. I actually didn't know that, uh, so I've learned something here. So let's talk about um, criticism. Uh, one of the things, if, if you see a problem in your town or your community and you want to speak up and do something about it, one of the things that's pretty much guaranteed is criticism. There will be critics that don't like what you're saying. And that was certainly the case for you, wasn't it, Ed? It was once I became effective. It was not before I became effective. And that's generally the way things happened. If you're not effective and you're criticizing something, uh, the regulatory agency and the proponents of that concept will generally try to get you on board and explain to you very nicely. And if you're naive and don't have the data, uh, they assume a position of, of, of being your friend. But once you uh, become effective in building a case for your argument, then the dynamics change and you no longer are friends, but are an adversary. And then the criticism comes. And so then the criticism, any, go ahead. Do you have any um, advice or suggestions uh, for our listeners uh, on how to handle that criticism when it inv invariably it will come if you're effective? Well, yes, uh, it's very difficult to be in a position where authorities criticize you as an individual or as a, or as a group. Um, the advice I have is to uh, find reputable people who 
or an agreement with you who will offer you support and who can offer you additional expertise that you may not have. And so uh, it's very important to not look towards the regulatory authorities to save the save you and your project uh, because they uh, are viewed as the regulatory agency for protecting the environment. That generally is in name only and basically these uh, regulatory agencies are there to issue permits and not prevent the issuance of permits. So they have to justify their decisions. And so then you become adversarial if you are in conflict with their, uh, with the things that they do. That must have been a very disappointing discovery on your part to find out, uh, you know, the real truth about what it takes to, you know, stop people from, um, to prevent a, uh, wrong procedures from being done. That must have been disappointing, but you didn't, you didn't give up though. I mean, a lot of people I know would have said, well, I've done what I could. I brought it to the proper authorities, but you didn't give up. You understood that that wouldn't be enough and you didn't give up. So you said that the criticism started after you became effective. So what, what was, what changed? What did you different, what did you do differently that made you more effective? Well, I brought up the issues uh, a year or so before uh, and I even tried to cooperate with the uh, consultants who were, who were uh, leading this project. And uh, I didn't see them as, as adversaries at that time. However, I was convinced that the, that the concept was flawed. I couldn't at that time explain the technical reasons why it was flawed, but my intuition was strong that discharging over 6 million gallons a day per day of, of treated sewage into a natural wetland uh, was not as good an idea as they were making it sound to be. So at what point uh, did, you, did you say, that's it, gloves off, I'm gonna start sounding the alarm, I'm gonna start saying something about all this. At, at what point did you realize I've got to do something and I've got to do something right now? Well, when I, went public with the information that I had and the criticism that I had. Uh, up until going public, uh, nothing was really recorded. Nothing was really uh, impactful from my, pos from my stance. Uh, so they had nothing to fear. But once I gave a presentation to the local Rotary Club and presented photographs of the, of the degradation of the marsh, uh, since it was uh, receiving the sewage effluent. Uh, at that point, uh, there was the resistance rose up. And so um, you, I, could, I could determine that there was a changing of uh, attitudes at that point. At about what year was this? Approximately what year? Uh, I think that was 2009. Oh, well, by saying. 2009, the people of Louisiana, you, you can't live in South Louisiana and not be aware that we were losing our wetlands, a football field a day. I mean, right. everybody knew, the children knew, everybody knew that we're losing our wetlands and how important they are. So if, if you showed them slides about how this process this, uh, this, this flawed concept, as you referred to it, was actually destroying our wetland, that will, that will get your attention. And, and it, it obviously worked. Uh, so, didn't, so what happened after that um, Rotary Club meeting? What came next? Well, they, uh, there was no denying that the marsh had degraded since the sewage uh, effluent was being discharged into mm -hmm. it. Uh, but they had to come up with an alternative reason so they came up with the idea that nutria were responsible for eating up the marsh. For uh, our listeners that are outside of Louisiana, nutria is a very, very large uh, rodent that is not indigenous to this area that was introduced some 100 years ago. And mm -hmm. they, they multiply like rabbits and they do cause a lot of damage to our wetlands. But so that's what, the, uh, that's what these companies were blaming 
the uh, the uh, loss of wetland, they were blaming the nutria, but that, and you knew that wasn't the case. Right, I knew it wasn't the case because they did not keep records. They made mm -hmm. assertions and hypothetical uh, claims, uh, but they did not keep records of how many nutria they killed or were present in the area. And the wetlands adjacent to this particular area was not damaged only because of the wastewater that was entering that particular area. Uh, and they claimed that the wastewater attracted the nutrients that made the vegetation grow and then the nutria ate that, but uh, that was based on very little. You and you know, said so, and you said so. Different. Yes. I and I understand much. you won uh, two uh, major awards after you started sounding the alarm. Well, eventually I did, but uh, one was from the uh, uh, Louisiana Wildlife Federation for volunteer conservationists, and another was a stewardship award from the Coalition to Restore Coastal uh, Wetlands in Louisiana. Um, well, but, congratulations. Uh, well, uh, it was nice, and I appreciated the recognition, but there was many, you know, it, it it started out with me alone, but it didn't wind up with me alone. So it, it, because it can't, no one single person can can change a tide like that alone. Uh, I, I wish I wish we could, but we have to work with other people, um, and we have to create a, a a force to get something done. But it's not, but it's not that hard to do. It's really not. And I and I know, I know you, Ed, and I know you didn't. Uh, didn't do all your work for the awards. I know that. On the other hand, awards generates more attention to what you're doing. Awards generates credibility, which brings more attention to what you're doing. So it all kind of feeds feeds upon itself. And, and speaking of things feeding, uh, another great way to get your message out if you see a problem in your community is to get an opinion piece printed in the local newspaper. And I understand that you were very successful getting op-eds printed in the local papers. Isn't that right? Uh, I've printed, I wrote some op-eds. Yes, that's correct. And of course they were criticized from the oppositions who countered with their own op-eds, but it raised the consciousness of people. Uh, and that's, that was fine with me. Uh, I, I know, and I'm confident that my position is, is sound. So the more people who are willing to investigate it or look into it, whether they are on my side or the other side, I think that um, the issue will become more clear. But it, it can be a complicated thing and you can be um, persuaded or dissuaded depending on who you talk to. And um, so I'm more open to the disclosure as I, as, as I can see it. And uh, I, I'm confident that the more people know, the more they will realize that uh, you can't just um, look at things from a positive view without considering the liabilities as well. Well, you pointed out that when you wrote those opinion pieces, which did draw uh, attention to what you were doing, you said that brought a, a whole barrage of criticism of itself. But, but you know what I say in this situation? If you had been out there saying the world was flat, you wouldn't have had any criticism. But you were out there speaking the truth and therefore you got criticism and therefore you know you're either 100% right or certainly on the right track. So Ed, if you could go back in time to a decade ago or you know, 15 years ago, you know, before you started sounding the alarm and trying to get the truth out, what? Uh, little secrets or hints or tips would you have told yourself if you could go back in time and talk to yourself back then? Uh, told myself about what? Certainly. How about, with, um, Jess, we're going to start from scratch. I'm going to ask the question again. Okay? okay. So we're starting now. So Ed, I, I've got a question for you. If you could go back in time and talk to yourself and give yourself some hints or tips that you will need to get you through the next 15 years, what would you have told yourself? Well, first of all, I would have told myself uh, to look to see uh, 
how important this issue is. And if you can honestly answer that this is a very important issue, which I eventually realized that it was. It was for me personally, because this was a wetlands that I was personally uh, associated with since childhood and loved dearly. So I did not want this taking place, but beyond that, the concept could be uh, subject to other wetlands and that, and I didn't want that to happen either. Uh, so I wanted to stop it in the, as soon as I could, if, I, if possible. But you wish uh, you'd been a little bit more you know, forceful and aggressive than you were? Well, I wish I had the wisdom at that time to have started documenting things right up front, because mm -hmm. that way I could have documented how it was much more clearly before and then shown the contrast mm -hmm. as to what actually happened. Fortunately, I did document a lot with photography. And so I did have some photography before and then a lot of photography after, um, after the project started. So uh, up front, I would say document, 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 mm -hmm. photograph, uh, record every conversation. And one important thing, never ever, communicate with uh, regulatory agencies or the opposition verbally. Okay. Do it in writing. I would, that was one mistake I made because uh, if I had recorded, had all the comments that were made to me in writing, I would have had much easier uh, time down the road referring back to them. But I believe that's excellent advice for our listeners. In fact, mm -hmm. in my world, every verbal conversation I have about my work, I consider it off record. It's just consider right. it off record and, and, and not use and, and therefore unusable uh, and in, in actually, any form. And actually it's good to avoid those kind of conversations. Uh, make your comments in writing and request that you get a response in writing. And that way it's documented. Uh, Excellent. You know, I got, I got some advice, I mean, excuse me. In fact, I got some uh, criticism just yesterday. Uh, I have stuck out my neck and taken, and taken a position to give voice to people in the city who are about to lose as many as six of their public tennis courts. And so I've stuck out my neck, I'm taking a risk and I'm giving them a voice. And, and none of this is for myself, none of this is for anything uh, for my friends and me, it's for all of us, it's for all people who love recreational spaces. And I got criticism yesterday. And, and so uh, uh, my thought was, well, I must be doing something right if I'm getting criticism. And uh, to all you listeners, you should expect criticism and hope you get it because that means you're making progress. It means you're making progress. It means you're, you're hitting the opposition where it hurts. And, and that's when the criticism comes and that's when you know you're getting there. So Ed, is there any last things you'd like to add before we sign off? We're almost out of time. Okay, uh, one thing is that when you have a environmental concern and it shows up in your backyard, and you feel like you're up against uh, impossible force, um, don't think that way because all these backyard episodes that affect you personally are connected to everybody else's backyard. And the thread that runs through your yard connects your neighbor and that connects things globally. And many of the environmental issues that we advocate for or against start in your backyard, expand to your region, but have a global connection. And we're seeing this, we're seeing these connections grow and you are contributing a great deal if you stand firm with yours and, 
and try and tie in your local concern with regional, national, and global concerns. Well, that's really beautiful advice, and it means you really can change the world right from your backyard. It's possible. It's possible. Uh, to contribute. Possible. And um, we don't always win an outright victory like we wish we could, but it's a long battle, and it, the battle is for the mindset of the public to change and be more sensitive and more responsible for the environment. And we can all work together doing that, but it starts with an individual often, but it expands quite rapidly if you stay the course. And one day it started with you and here we are today. Well, Thank you, Ed Bodker, so much for joining me. I hope all of you enjoyed this episode. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you can beat the big guys. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks so much. Okay.